Spartans said they were tough. The Spartans said they would flinch. And they did. First and foremost, Michigan State football is about integrity, discipline, unselfishness, toughness, and accountability. The incidents involved a, involving a small group of our players do not represent our culture. Second, I made a decision. I made a decision to suspend players based upon video evidence that was provi provided to me and our athletic director yesterday. The suspensions will allow the players to receive academic support and medical services, but they will not be able to attend any, any organized team activities, including meetings, practices, weight training, or games. Our entire team We'll be cooperating with law enforcement and the Big Ten Conference to further evaluate the events in Ann Arbor. These suspensions will remain in place until the investiga investigations are completed. When we have a full report, I will address further actions if needed. We're not here to make any excuses for the behaviors Saturday. They are unacceptable. It's also very important to say we honor the traditions of the Big Ten Conference. And welcome to another episode of the SD4L show. I'm Justin Thind. I'm here with my co-host, Brian Massal. Brian, how are you doing today? I'm uh, fantastic. How about you? Good, good. Little, little embattled. I was gonna say. I was, I was gonna ask. Are you embattled or are you fine? I, I mean, you know, yeah. we're 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 obviously smarting from the weekend and mm. what what's transpired, but um, we're gonna move forward. We're gonna move forward. Yeah, yeah. I guess I guess first we'll start talking about the game itself. Um, well, yeah, we'll keep it football at first. We'll talk about Michigan. Talk about Illinois. Um, and then I think you can circle back and, and talk about the um, sort of the festivities that occurred uh, in the tunnel. But uh, yeah, so starting off uh, with Michigan, I think Owen, you have a video as well. But um, I think, yeah, Brian, do you want to talk about what you kind of saw from the game itself? Um, and we can kind of go from there. You know, I, I watched a, a defense that was much improved. Um, I saw us get off to a quick start. I thought we played very well. We had some mistakes early on. Um, you know, I thought a couple plays changed the game in the first half. You know, a couple fourth down plays where uh, we couldn't convert. You know, when you look at the end of the first half, you saw that 10-7 that on the five and fourth down. Uh, um, you're you're going to get very few chances in the red zone right. against uh, a team like that. So punching that in is absolutely crucial. Right. Uh, so couple of those i thought that third down spot not to make excuses but that yeah. third down spot was awful um percentage wise of over overturning a fourth down spot um are are one of the the least overturned plays when you look at analytics in, in all of college football right so i mean all in all i thought the defense played very very well i really did when you can yeah. hold a team um, of michigan's caliber to five field goals and i thought we protected pretty well I thought we we won a lot of 50-50 jump balls. Yeah, um, we had our chances. Yeah, I mean, let's just be honest. Yeah, I mean it's ten seven. You punch that in, you make it fourteen seven. Yep. Kick a field goal, you make it ten ten. Yep. It's a whole different, whole different game. And yeah. You know, you go in a half down thirteen seven even. Mm -hmm. You know, and you come out third quarter and you go three and out, three and out, three and out. I guess you know, and that's. And that's a ball game, you yeah. know. A bad snap on on um, mm. a couple of bad snaps on on the punt teams and special teams. Yeah. We, had, we had a couple of guys go down, but all in all, I thought the defense played well. I thought that the um, the offense in the second half, 
you know, was hoping for a better response. Yeah. Uh, but you, you really, you can't fault the effort of the game. I mean, I thought the young men played really hard. Yeah, I, I agree. I think um, speaking of those uh, two f- fourth and ones in the first uh, half, um, I said after the first quarter ended that the one that happened in the first quarter should have been a quarterback sneak. I said that in my, my tweet. Um, and at the end of the day, I think um, for the most part, if you're a Michigan State fan, you could be at peace with the first one. Um, even with the very bad spot on third down, even with them somehow overturning it. The second one, though, that one not being a quarterback sneak, which Peyton Thorne said in the press conference to his credit that that was his fault for not checking into that play, that one had to be a quarterback sneak. And I agree with what you said. If you get that, you have the correct play call, you get that, it's 14-10. Complexion of the game is very different then, especially if Michigan continues to go down to the, down to the red zone and kick a field goal the next possession, 14-13 there, and then you have a chance before halftime. So I, I think that right there, that, that second, fourth, and one that they didn't get, that's what really, really had a pivot point for the game itself. And then, yeah, in the second half, the offense really didn't have anything going. Um, I wonder if that would have been the case had the momentum shifted on that the fourth and one. But at the end of the day, that's something we have seen now several times. We saw the second half of the Maryland game. Um, in the first half of the Maryland game, MSU had 15 first downs. They were on pace for 500 yards. Second half, the, the teams kind of made adjustments. And we saw the Minnesota game. There was not a lot of offensive hope. And now this is once again a pattern. But I want to talk positively about the defense, as you also said. Um, Michigan had one real touchdown drive that whole game. Um, they did have that, obviously, um, the bad snap that led to the 10-yard uh, run right after that. Um, Michigan State is missing their long snapper, their scholarship long snapper, Hank Pepper. They're playing with a backup walk-on long snapper that has led to um, a few mistakes here over the the last few weeks. Uh, There was the high snap that didn't lead to anything. Then there was the high snap that led to the Michigan possession. Then there was uh, the uh, ground ball snap against Wisconsin. And um, that's hurt Michigan State now significantly. And um, I know nobody wants to talk about injuries, but that is a direct correlation of your scholarship long snapper being out causing you pain. Um, And then really when it comes to what Michigan did in this game, you see um, just a very, very consistent running game. Um, Outside of that, because that was to be expected, really the two concepts that seemed to work the most for them was passing to the tight end and J.J. McCarthy running a few times. I think McCarthy, the, the running there, I think even that you somewhat accept because you're not going to have a spy on him just because he runs a few times. A few times it hurts, but I don't think you alter your game plan because of that. But really, um, at the end of the day, those tight end passes, I think those also go differently if Darius Snow is in the game. Uh, you have a coverage linebacker that's a former safety in that spot instead of Cal Halliday and some of these guys trying to cover him. But again, I'm sure people, nobody wants to hear about the injuries, even though they might have a factual basis for how different the game could have been. But yeah, at the end of the day, really, that's, that's all that there is to say there. Michigan played a good game. Their running game is very strong. They're going to have a lot of success with that. And uh, I think you can take away some positives from Michigan State's defense, only giving up one touchdown, holding them to 20 um, eight points despite Michigan being a 42 point per game team but yeah that's that's pretty much the the gist of that game offense needs to figure it out but I think yeah that, that pretty much recaps it I mean I think the red zone defense was outstanding definitely absolutely outstanding and I thought we opened up the game well um, I thought the first drive we had a chance and we got that 15 yard unsportsmanlike penalty mm. we had three or four penalties on that first drive yeah a lot of self-inflicted wounds yeah a lot of common theme penalties with who is committing them as well and you can't like against a team like like this yeah. you can't do it you're only going to get so many chances in the red zone yeah you're only going to get so many chances to to not make mistakes and only so many plays i mean michigan is a as a an outstanding football team they run the ball very well um and you know why the defense to me was so impressive is that uh in the red zone, mm-hmm. if you can run the ball, you score touchdowns. Yeah. And we held them to five field goals. And so I thought the defense played exceptionally well. I agree. I, I absolutely. I thought uh, Scotty Hazleton over the last couple of weeks has done an outstanding job of shifting to a, a 4-3 defense, moving uh, Jacoby uh, over to linebacker. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, they got X back. Yeah, and I think that's big difference. Ma- it's made a huge difference, right? Yeah. And so when you see the tight end running free, 
you see some of their crossing patterns yeah. and you you just wonder what 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 it would look like if yeah. uh, Darius was out there. Exactly, yeah, because because people have continuously commented in my stories in The Athletic and, and everywhere where I've mentioned injuries, and they've said, I don't care, defense shouldn't be this bad. I agree. I don't. The defense, again, the Minnesota game and around that part of the season, it was playing at a D-minus level at best. All I was saying was when you, to begin with, going into the season as a unit, we're going to be maybe a B-minus, C-plus unit. It's not that unfair to say you have gone from maybe a C plus unit to a D minus unit because of injuries. Nobody's saying that this defense should should be playing this poorly or that they were going to be just legendary had there not have been injuries. But it is undeniable that the second that Xavier Henderson comes back, the defense looks significantly better. If you would have played this game without Xavier Henderson or you would have had this game on the schedule right when the Minnesota game happened, they're not holding Michigan to 14 points less than their season points per game. That, to me, is a direct correlation of what just one injured player coming back, and actually Jacob Slade, too. But now imagine if Jeff Petrowski is back and you don't have to play a true freshman defensive end, and imagine if Darius Snow is back. I, I think the defense could have been playing at that B-minus, C-plus level. I really do. Yeah, I mean, you, you get you know Slade, Jacoby, Winman, and X back, right? So you got, like I said last week, is that you got three – different levels of leaders mm -hmm. and, and you're seeing the difference in defense coaches don't become bad overnight mm -hmm. right if, yeah. if if there are players executing their scheme they know what they're doing right scotty hazelton knows what he's doing right. as much as he has drawn the, the 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 ire of the fan base he's still an outstanding coach and so you know i thought they've really they really stepped up and when you look at the players of the game when you recap you know, you look at Keon Coleman, who had a, a 155 yards and, and one touchdown. He looked like a, a young man that's going to be playing on Sundays. I mean, he was going up, getting balls. Yep. And I thought he did an outstanding job, absolutely outstanding job of, of being able to, uh, you know, showing not only um, speed, but being able to go up and, and get those 50-50 balls. Yeah. We got highlights of Keon. Yeah, I think they've been sprinkled in, in here as well. Um, but, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, that pretty much sums up most of the Michigan game in that regard. You want to talk about Illinois now, Brian? Yeah, I mean, I thought Keon yeah. played well. I thought X played extremely well. Right, X And so too. X was, was absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Right? And so now we, we head on to a very surprising 7-1 and one Brett Bielema-led Illini. Yeah. And uh, we're a little shorthanded, yeah. given what's transpired over the past week. And, you know, when you look at it, you know, I kind of felt like the MSU's defense turned the corner. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I think I think the most important thing for the defense, obviously, when we go back to it, is just getting off the field on third down. Uh, you can't allow their running back, Chase Brown, to have his way. And we really got to work on taking away uh, Isaiah Williams, who has been outstanding for them. Uh, on Remember, the they used to have a quarterback named Isaiah, Will or yeah, quarterback named Isaiah Williams, Juice Williams. That's, I remember Juice Williams. Yeah, his name was Isaiah Williams. He played at Illinois. It, same name, Isaiah Williams. I remember yeah. Juice Williams. Yeah. I remember Isaiah. Was it the same name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Isaiah, Isaiah was his given name. So now they have another guy, same football program, same name, same side of the ball. About a decade later, I think. Yeah, I, I, I was young back then, but I remember Juice Williams was their quarterback when I was kind of getting into college football. I remember watching them against Ohio State, and they won that game. And yeah. I remember them going to the Rose Bowl. That was what year was that? I forgot. That might have been around the time. Yeah, I think Juice Williams was the quarterback yeah, of one I, of those I, teams. I remember that game yeah. at Ohio State. They won that game. Yeah. And uh, what's his name was a cook, the, the coach, the former Florida uh, coach, Ron Zook. Mm, Ron Zook. Yeah, I remember Ron, Ron Zook. Zook. But uh, Brett Bielema has done, a, done an yeah. outstanding job. Yep. And to have them seven and one, yeah. you know, obviously, you know, I think there's a, we've got to find a way to get Jaden Reed the ball, mm -hmm. Jaden and Key on the ball. Yeah. Um, I think the O-line has to obviously improve. Um, you know, we've we got to be able to run the ball. Yeah. Well, I know, you know, Mel talked about some injuries that we had inside. Mm -hmm. And a couple think, guards. Yeah, a couple guards got hurt, uh, which might make it a little bit harder. Yeah. Uh, do you know if we're getting our long snappers back? I don't think that Hank Pepper will be back in the near term. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't expect him to be back in the next couple of weeks at least. Yeah, so when you think about it, right, I mean, we're, we're going to be down, what, eight, 
eight to ten guys. Yeah, and, and uh, two world. of them that started last week, and Zion and Jacoby, and and Gross even. Yeah, and so we're it's a tall it's a tall task. Yeah. There's no question, it's a tall task. Yeah, and and you know, can we go in there and win? Yeah, we're still. This team was still preseason ranked. This team is still confident. They can still play. They believe in their coach, and they believe in their staff. And I believe we can go in there and win. Yeah, I think um, putting some context to Illinois and who they kind of are. Um, first, let's look at scoring offense. Illinois was tied 85th um, when I checked this morning. They are averaging 26 points per game. To put that into further context, MSU is 93rd in the nation, averaging 24 points per game. So basically in the same tier mm -hmm. of offense as what Michigan State has, despite them having a really, really underrated running back in Chase, uh, in, in Chase Brown. Now defense-wise, as you see there in the picture, Illinois has the best defense in college football. Out of all 131, I think it is now, teams, he, uh, over there, Ryan Walters, the defensive coordinator, has the number one defense in college football. And you see who they're ahead of. They're ahead of Georgia, Michigan, Minnesota, Iowa, um, Alabama, Ohio State. So just a phenomenal job by the young Ryan Walters, who is the quarterback or the uh, defensive coordinator over there. He actually became a Power 5 position coach two years after his college football career ended, I believe, at Arizona. So... Just a big fan of what he's done and his career trajectory. And um, I guess uh, speaking of Michigan State's defense positively as, as well, like we were kind of saying earlier, personally, I think they've turned a corner uh, since that Maryland game when they kind of switched their, their scheme up a little bit. Um, if you look at the Maryland game, they allowed one touchdown in the final eight drives that Maryland had. The next week, um, unfortunately, they played Ohio State. So to me, that doesn't count towards the sample size, I suppose, because there's not really anybody stopping Ohio State. We'll see what Michigan can do, I guess, at the end of the year. But even Penn State gave up 40-something points, and they have a much better defense than, than Michigan State. Um, and then the game after that against Wisconsin, in regulation, they gave up two touchdown drives where Xavier Henderson was on the field. I know Wisconsin went down the field and scored on the scripted plays when Henderson left off after the first play of the drive. But to me, the Maryland game and the Wisconsin game were plus points for the defense. The Michigan game was mostly a plus point. Statistically, yardage-wise, they got gassed. But all that matters is points on the board. Like I said, 14 points less than they, Michigan scores on average. So that's three plus games from the defense and the Ohio State game. So to me, personally, I think the defense is going to be a storyline to watch, and I think they've played well mostly recently. Um, and then really the other thing is that with Illinois having kind of a mediocre offense, um, it'll be hard, obviously, without Jacoby, Zion, and, and Gross a little bit, but um, that gives Michigan State a chance. They're playing a mediocre offense. Maybe they can pull out sort of like a 13-10 to 10 kind of an ugly game. So we'll see, but those are really all the thoughts I had on Illinois. Well, we're going to find out. Yeah. Absolutely. Now to the the topic that's really taken on the headline that we're still talking about. The World Series? No. Oh. Not not in De not in Detroit. Maybe in, in Okay. Yeah. All right. What's yeah. the series there? It's still 0-0. Zero, zero. It is. All right. Yeah. So post-game altercation obviously has made headlines across the country. Um so a lot of a lot of a lot of us are very sad about what has transpired. Um, I think it's important to uh, let's tell Coach uh, Harbaugh's. You want to play it? Play it right now. Okay. So that was um, uh, Curtis Daniels. Freddie Lope posted that on Twitter. Thank you, uh, 
Freddie. And then, um, you know, before yesterday's recent events or today or last night's events, uh, uh, Coach Tucker issued a statement. You want to show a statement? Yeah, we'll show it. Coach talked about, I can't even, my eyesight is, oh, well, let me read, read that for us. All right, Michigan State football core values include integrity, discipline, unselfishness, toughness, and accountability. After reviewing the disturbing electronic evidence collected to date of the altercation between Michigan State University and Michigan student athletes on October 29th, 2022, we are suspending Tank Brown, Crump, Angelo Gross, and Zion Williamson effectively immediately. We are currently working with law enforcement, Michigan State, and Michigan campus leadership and the Big Ten Conference to further evaluate the events in Ann Arbor, including but not limited to addition, additional student-athletes participation in the altercation and contribution factors. The initial student-athletes suspensions will remain in place until the investigation are completed. The health and safety of our student-athletes, coaches, personnel, and the Spartan community remain our number one priority. You get the gist of it from there. We sure do. Um, it's a very, very unfortunate situation. And I thought Michigan State was swift in their action. Anytime you swing a helmet, it's absolutely unacceptable. There's no excuse for that, regardless of what's transpired. Um, so is, are, are U of M and Harbaugh done Suspending our players? That's what I want to know. Are we done with that? Because this has turned into a, a PR propaganda thing. Michigan State has taken the appropriate, appropriate steps. Agree or not, bending the knee, bowing or not, to their administration, to their narrative, to all the media, whatever you want to say, you know, you can say that, you can argue that. Um, one of our young men swung a helmet. Others were involved in altercations. There's no question. Those suspensions, and we have dealt with them swiftly. Mel Tucker has responded admirably and done what he's supposed to do. He's got his players back. He's got every Spartan dog's back. We're going to protect, but we're going to punish our kids. We're going to throw them under the bus. These are young men that make mistakes, that every one of us has made mistakes growing up. Does it excuse the behavior? Absolutely not. The behavior is inexcusable. Does that mean we throw him under the bus and throw the baby out with the bathwater? No, absolutely not. Um, you know, Coach Harbaugh's out there talking about wanting charges pressed. Fine. You know what? It is what it is. Whatever happens, happens. The prosecutors might do that. Coach, were you out there asking for Jawan to get charged with assault when he slapped the coach? I mean, the hypocrisy coming out of Ann Arbor is something else absolutely and i know this is not a popular take i totally get it totally get it msu has stepped up we've stepped up and and some will argue we've we've bowed and we bent the knee to them over there and and kind of overreacted and anytime you swing a helmet you know pictures tell a thousand words and so it's something that i think we take very seriously but what are they going to do in Ann Arbor, right? We've now suspended eight players. We've issued multiple statements. Sam Stanley on his way out. Before he even saw the video, came out and issued a statement apologizing profusively and all that. And I get it. I, I mean, I get, I get it, right? Pictures tell a thousand words and they're very powerful. And nobody here is going to defend what, what some of our young men have done. There's absolutely no question about it. But at the same token... What has the University of Michigan done, right? What have they done to alleviate incidents like this? I'm just asking a question. I'm not defending anything that we have done. There's been three incidents in the tunnel now uh, over the last seven games. You, you got the video of, of their players, Will, um, Owen? You know, we, we, we have, you know, Michigan players heading up, skipping up the tunnel. Um, where's security at? I'm only asking where's security at. That's what I'm asking. I want to know where, where are they to divide 
and and protect and make sure that there isn't an issue going this is a very heated rivalry it's gotten re- it's gotten really nasty it's gotten really nasty on social media it's gotten really nasty amongst the fan base it used to be fun it's not fun you have an african american head coach that his head is being touched by a player and if anybody knows that is a, a very negative connotation if you're if you're from that community and you're a person of color you know that there that is a very offensive racially charged jester i mean it just is and if you ask anybody so my question is where are we now we we've, we've suspended eight players we've spent, we have suspended eight players we have done you know some will argue maybe too much where is the response from u of m why is their player heading up the tunnel why is somebody touching our coach's head why how come the 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 safety and welfare of msu's players is not protected who's not gonna bend the knee who's not gonna bow and bend the knee why were they yelling their head coach is at our door yelling at our players why when the video comes out the video will show that they were one of them they threw the first punch not that it justifies a helmet swing never ever ever but when that comes out who's going to be held responsible for that why was somebody affiliated with their program coach or not making a gun gesture with his hand why did our team have to leave out the back door and board the buses with troopers because of the angry mob who's going to protect the welfare and safety of our young men our spartan dogs again swinging a helmet fighting five six eight on one whatever you want to call it whatever the video shows unacceptable unacceptable and our staff has dealt with it they have dealt with it they've issued their statements they have taken the appropriate steps and suspending our players and doing the things that every university should do so what is jim harbaugh's next move when he when when the final story is told when he's out there extolling you know charges should be pressed against these young men and he wants to cite d'antonio and that's not the player it's the program and all those comments and keep insinuating and instigating the situation and the media on cue everybody dived in and we had all the editorials and everybody dive in and jump in i didn't see any of those editorials come out when joan slapped the coach should he be charged with assault again i'm not justifying anything that msu did absolutely not 100 percent wrong they should be punished and should be dealt with accordingly but sometimes as a spartan you do see the hypocrisy and you do see the double standard and you go back to 2018 we can go back where i can name you 20 incidents i can go to 18 when devin bush kicked up our 50 yard line i can go back to the locker room that many of you don't know that they put feces all over our locker room that was never discussed never talked about in the media ever yet D'Antonio was reprimanded. Michigan State was reprimanded. And we took it. We just took it. And at what point, at what point do we not take it? And do we stick up for our young men? We stick up for our Spartan dogs. And we punish them. We punish them. And we, we hold them accountable. Yet we protect. We protect at the end of the day that these are still young men making poor decisions that are learning life lessons. Will that be justified? No, absolutely not. The lawyer out there tweeting all about who's going to criminal charges and all that. Hey, buddy, your lawsuit, you'll be suing the University of Michigan for it's over. For failure to say, protect whoever your, your, um, your clients are. That's where your lawsuit's coming from. So all this grandstanding that you're doing on Twitter and all this social media stuff to get attention, some of it, the charges will, will probably, could probably happen and will probably be charged. And some of it, you know, could be justified. And rightfully so. 
I mean, rightfully so. I will not defend any of those actions. Any of those actions, any perpetrator, anybody that did anything that was unbecoming of our culture and our program and our standard, any of them should be held accountable. But at what point do we say, all right, we've suspended our eight. We're doing everything that we can. We're going to protect the integrity of the institution, but where is the other side in this? How come there isn't security in the tunnel? Why are their players skipping up the tunnel, jawing? Why did one of their players throw the first punch? How did that happen? Why are we getting hand gestures with guns? Why do we got to take our team out the back of the tunnel? Why? This stuff is not being told, but it's the truth. It's the truth and it'll all come. And if anybody knows me, they know that all I do is tell the truth. And I will always tell the truth. What we did was unacceptable. What our young men did was unacceptable. But there's two sides to blame in all this. There's two sides to blame in all this. And, and the video shows that we're taking most of the brunt and most of the blame. And I get it. I totally get it. A lot of it is deserved. A lot of it is. We will not defend the actions. But at some point, some point, when Jim Harbaugh gets off of his holier-than-thou kick and, you know, wants to sit down and talk about not all, you know, American Sniper, not Black Lives Matter and Kaepernick, not abortion, not all those controversial topics. When he wants to sit down and talk about his program and the way his players are acting, he's contributing to how nasty this rivalry has begun become. The fan base, honestly, both fan bases, Twitter was nasty over the past week. Social media was absolutely nasty. This rivalry has gone somewhere. It doesn't need to go. It does not need to go. Now, we want to sit and point fingers at each other and blame each side. Fine. That's not going to resolve anything. I've never heard a player like Blake Corum call out the opposing head coach, I've never heard of that. I've never seen that in my life, ever. And I'm not talking about just Blake. I'm just saying this is where the rivalry has gone, that we're calling out head coaches. We're, we're at a bad place in this rivalry, and, and, and I think a lot of us have to do with what transpired in the tunnel. We're not going to make excuses. We're not going to blame each side. Each side's accountable. Everybody's got to hold their side accountable. Michigan State has done that. They're holding their side accountable. Will the other side do that? Will the other side do that? Justin? Yeah, I think um, uh, there's a lot to, a lot to unpack in this situation, and I think uh, you touched on a lot of the angles uh, thoroughly as well. So um, now we have um, our guest joining us for this episode. And um, it's a very popular figure in East Lansing and in the sport of women's college soccer. It is Big Ten champion, uh, Coach Jeff Hostler. Coach, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm great. Uh, you know, anytime you say Big Ten champion, you know, things are going pretty well. So I'm yeah. thrilled to be on with you, too. Uh, appreciate the time and the attention. Yeah, for sure. So uh, we're going to run through your whole kind of career uh, trajectory here, but we're going to start with the present. We're going to start with all sort of the accomplishment that you have in the buzz and all that that's happening with the team, the girls, the way you guys have been playing. So first of all, I've just got to ask you kind of point blank, what has the past week or so been like? You guys are getting finally uh, the due attention that your accomplishment deserves. You guys are all over Twitter. Reporters are covering the team that probably haven't done so in the past. So just going to ask, what's the buzz in the community been like? And what have the last few uh, days and the last week or so been like for you? Yeah, it's pretty great. You know, if you're on a SD4L podcast, things are going well. So, uh, <laughs> you know, we've hit the big time right now. Um, it's uh, it's been it's it's been awesome. You know, like going all the way back to whether well, it was four or five weeks ago, we got nationally ranked for the first time. Uh, the outcry support we had a lot of our support the season before we finally have the recognition of the national spotlight. Half the season, had, yeah, these last two weeks have been wild. Uh, fun. Uh, well, we're sitting here in Columbus now, 
with our Big Ten semifinal match tomorrow. We were here two weeks ago uh, playing number 17 Ohio State to play for the share of the uh, Big Ten championship that night. Uh, we're in the locker room and celebrating that thing. There's awesome Alan Hallowers there, Julie Burgess, uh, so many other support staff. We're in that that room all together. Lots of tears of joy and uh, man, it was uh, it's a pretty surreal thing. Uh, but then to find out, literally as wheels started rolling, uh, Northwesterns had lost. We were outright chance of the game to go. It was another outcry of emotion. So, uh, like this group is is really really special. Like you do that, you know, they haven't been in a championship environment before. Uh, be in that situation with the game in hand, and then turn around and come back and play in front of nearly 3,000 fans again at home against Rutgers uh, to wrap up the undefeated season made it even more special. Yeah, just following up there, Coach, the, the attendance, the fan support, just I was a student at Michigan State from 2017 to 2021, and I didn't see anything like that, like what I've seen in the videos right now. What has that been like to see to see that support recently? Yeah, it's been awesome. You know, I mean, our team obviously feeds off that. What, what team isn't going to tell you they're motivated by, you know, pack stands and, and an energized crowd. So, uh, you know, it goes back to the Michigan game. We set a new attendance record. We had shattered the last one by nearly a thousand fans. Uh, you know, our Minnesota match, our Rutgers match, all right at, near, right at or near that 3,000 mark. Um, so really, really especially when we do the starting 11s and both teams walk out and to hear the roar when they introduce us as we're walking out, you know, it's just, I mean, it's really got a 12th man kind of approach and, our kids play hard. I mean, our kids, you know, we talk about the recognition, like this is a really special group. I know every coach is going to tell you that their group works hard, um, but they pour everything they have into this. They're ultra committed to it. Uh, they have a lot of belief in what we're doing. And man, you see the crowd uh, packed like that, people in the stands and they're loud and energized. You're definitely going to play a little bit harder and even more on it. Hey coach, it's great. Thank you for joining us. And like winning an outright Big Ten title is special. It's something that that they can never take away from you. It is so hard to do. It always was a dream of mine when I played, to play in that Rose Bowl, to win an outright Big Ten title. And I got to believe that, um, that, it's, that that will help recruiting. When you talk about recruiting, because that's the, that's the bloodline of every sport, right? What is your, um, your kind of your recruiting philosophy and, and really like your future recruiting classes? What are you looking for? How do they look? Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, there's no question, like, success can breed success if you if you take the right approach to it. Uh, I learned a long time ago, you know, I was fortunate enough to play for a legendary coach at the D3 level. Um, that's, that's won, I think, five or six national championships now. When I first got my first head coaching job, I just turned 26 years old in college. And, uh, you know, what he told me was, like, you got to evaluate the player, not to make sure their, their traits measure up to what you want to do, but you also have to really evaluate um, you know, the person, who they are and what they stand for. The only way that's going to make a difference is if you know who you are and what you stand for. So I've really taken that uh, to heart over the years. I think the older I get, the more experience I have, you know, the more clear I am in my identity and how I want to shape the program. So uh, as we as we go, you know, Brian, you mentioned like winning a Big Ten uh, outright championships, incredibly special. And then to be undefeated, there's only nine teams that have ever done that in, in our sport in the Big mm. Ten. So, um, it makes it even more special. And uh, we're going to still recruit kids that, that match up with our non-negotiables, this group's non-negotiables, you know, ultra committed, high work ethic, family oriented, um, and just take pride in what they do all the time. Like, this is a, you know, a sisterhood. Uh, they're, they're, they battle for each other. We play with an edge. Uh, I know in, in, in tribute to Mark D'Antonio you had on last week, you know, like he always got so much respect for recruiting those three-star kids and developing into five stars. And there's a piece of that. I'm going to tell you right now, we're getting some of those five-star kids. Mm. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of excitement around this program and where we're going. That's, that's great to hear. And um, speaking kind of what you're going to do, I've got to ask you now that I think you've been here 16 months and you've already done something that hasn't been done, I think an undefeated Big Ten championship season. So what's next? What, where do you see the vision? What's your vision for the future of this program if you've already done so much in such a short time? Well, I'll give you the coach answer, and that's get ready for tomorrow in a big uh, <laughs> semifinal match you know, down here in Columbus uh, with a very talented Nebraska team. But, uh, you know, big picture. as a head coach, you also have to be a visionary and have big picture plans. And, uh, yeah, like I've never been one that projects out. I, I never have been that, like projecting out goals with a certain amount of wins or win a championship 
make the NCAA tournament, win the NCAA tournament, etc. Uh, because I really do believe it's the daily games that, that stack up. But um, you know, you win win a Big Ten championship like this year. You got two more matches to win another trophy uh, here this weekend. Have that opportunity before the NCAA tournament begins. And I think this is a place. I think this is a program uh, in short order to prove can be successful. Uh, I give a lot of credit to all the other different programs here that have been successful in football, basketball. Damon Rensing with men's, men's soccer has had an incredible run over the last decade. And honestly, like going through the interview process, this is what I talk about is, I mean, I, I have a lot of respect for what Damon's done, uh, what the men's soccer program's done. This is a talent-rich state. Uh, people are hungry for it. We talked about the crowds out at DeMartin. Uh, crowds even had the road. You know, we had uh, more fans in our Northwestern match than they did for, for a, a top 15 matchup. So um, there's a lot of excitement, a lot of buzz. I think this is a place that can, for and win championships on a regular basis, be in the mix, be recognized as a every year top 25 better program, and uh, keep the train rolling. So, Coach, let me ask you say I'm a recruit and you're in the kitchen dining table. You're not good I, enough. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> a given. But in this hypothetical, we're looking past that. Gotcha, gotcha. gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, so I ask you, why Michigan State, Coach? What is your sales pitch? I mean, it, besides, besides flash in the ring, besides yeah, flash in the ring. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go paperweight size. Uh, that boy, so, um, I, you know, I mean, East Lansing is a special place. I mean, I'm I'm born and raised here, so I, I've spent a large portion of my life. I've been around Michigan State athletics and seen it from the outside. You know, as a fan, uh, growing up, going to camps, things of that nature. I mean, people talk about family. I like. I don't know, every coach you guys have ever talked to and every any recruit that walks into a coach's office, they talk about culture, they talk about family, but it's how you define it and how you live it. And I think that's what's really special about Michigan State University is, I mean, we all stick together. Like, hard times, uh, we're there for each other. You know, good times, we all celebrate it together. Uh, you know, Jenison Fieldhouse with all the Olympic sports coaches, how many, how many of them have been through our office doors to say congrats, we have our players at fives, uh, stopped out training, you know, Izzo came out last week to congratulate the team and give a little message, uh, getting ready for postseason play. Uh, Bell's been super active, Helen Nola, field hockey, the list goes on and on and on. So uh, we talk a lot about family, we try to live it, uh, and I think that's one thing that just really sets us apart. In addition to an incredible fan base, like people bleed green. This is, I mean, it's crazy. This is a generational school. You know, like someone goes here, I talked to this with our, with our Texas kid that's a freshman, like your kids are probably gonna go to school here because the experience you're gonna have and how close that this community is and, and you're gonna want that experience for your own children. So when Izzo came out and speak to the team, did he did he yell at them? <laughs> did he get teed up? No. Just well, fortunately he came out, we're doing a, uh, a goal activity that, that, that's like pretty hard to not succeed in because we like to see the ball <laughs> at the back of the net before a game. Um, so I told him we were, we were at standard and he said he was all right. So he, uh, <laughs> you know, he, he had a good time with her. It was awesome. That's uh, You know, Coach, touching upon how you said you grew up in East Lansing, um, when you were younger, like what was your connection to MSU sports back then? And were you like a big fan or not? And some of your favorite memories, just curious. Yeah, no, I, I, man, Spartan, like it goes all the way back. So uh, my father was an attorney in town, uh, really kind of scratched uh, money together to have season tickets for basketball, largely to try and get clients. Um, and you know some of those lower profile non-conference games, little Jeff got to go, uh, you know, Jensen Fieldhouse is a, a six, seven, eight, nine year old uh, and watch those games. And I remember clearly, uh, like I used to, you know, six year old kid, I used to draw on the glass block in Jensen. Remember how hot, how loud it was in that place. Um, and all that glass block with sweat, I, you know, we draw in there and turn around and see a play. Uh, I remember clear as day, the first year of Breslin winning the Big Ten Championship. Uh, with Steve Smith uh, and that team. Uh, I remember the Sean Rest, the uh, Fire and Ice days with Sean Rest with Eric Snow. Like, what an incredibly fun you know team to watch back then. Um, you know, and I used to watch them too, like Pat, Stegging Guy, and then like later in life playing them at court one and back here in the back locally. And, and they could still whoop me around the court. So, uh, a lot of incredible memories. Uh, remember, you know, watching Judd all the time. Uh, I still remember the the, the Rose Bowl uh, against USC. I, I mean, I can still see Rodney Pete running for his life mm -hmm. in the last play of the game uh, before the sack or the throwaway uh, to win that Rose Bowl. 
and I go on and on. We don't have enough time to talk about all these stuff. Those are my most. But see that that like matters, right? When you coach there and the how you bleed green and white, like that matters. That resonates, you know, to to your your players and and who you're recruiting. Um, when you coached back at East Lansing High School, did you honestly ever imagine that you would coach at MSU back then? No. <laughs> no. Um, I got my start coaching middle school um, girls basketball at uh, McDonald Middle School and freshman soccer for Nick Archer uh, with the high school. So, I mean, I did it because I love sports. And frankly, like I was, I was kind of biding some time uh, before trying to really figure out what I was going to do next. Uh, professionally after grad college you know Archer was the one that kind of told me just to get out to the field and just show up I thought I was going to maybe you know train the varsity team during preseason or something I was like hey well that team down there needs to coach it's a freshman you should do it I said no and he goes well I'm not really asking so uh, that's how I kind of got my start in coaching I was fortunate my father you know, was an attorney by day as I mentioned he coached all four of our you know us kids in various sports so many different youth teams to be where I saw the impact that he made because of the relationships, uh, the life lessons he helped teach through athletics, uh, the support he had for families and the community through it. And, and that part of it resonated with me. So I just want to get into it, honestly, like make a little scratch. I'd be a bomb line trying to figure out what I was going to do. And I fell in love with it right away. You know, like six months later, six or seven different teams between club soccer, AAU basketball, joined the basketball staff at East Lansing. On and on and on. I was fortunate, you know, like at 25, 26, I coached out of college, you know, that opportunity. Incredible, incredible great place to attend at Valley State. And, and even when I, when I accepted the job, I, I literally hung up the phone and I was with my wife. We were driving, we were leaking the phone to ask the job. I really love this. Look at this. This is real. This is happening. So wow. It is, it is an everyday dream for me. Uh, so blessed, so blessed. You know, Coach, we'll leave you with one last question. Um, you had a very dominant team at Grand Valley State. You won uh, seven conference titles there. You advanced to 11 straight Elite Eights. You won the Natty in 2019. And his first two years as well. And Yeah, his first yeah. two years as well. Um, but when you look at MSU, 16 months after you were hired, this is a very rare accomplishment. 16 months after you were hired, you, you've you, you've done something that hasn't been done in MSU history before. You had an undefeated Big Titles Big Ten title season, right? And you won a Big Ten championship. How did you make that? I know you got three young ladies in the, in the portal. How did you make that happen so quickly? Yeah, I mean, I certainly had to use the portal a lot, um, and I can come back to that, but. I didn't make it. This group did. Uh, they had a choice to make. I was hired June 14th. So that gave me less than six weeks before our very first position. So I got in this again for relationships. I had a great group of that value. It was really hard to say goodbye to all of them. And immediately got the phone, get visits set up with all of them here in Michigan State. So trying to build relationships, um, sim simulate a team. Uh, I also didn't want to watch too much video where I had preconceived notions about each player's ability. Uh, so I wanted to have enough to get it some baseline, high enough for a full of people's form. So I wanted to give everyone an opportunity. I think that's the only way, only fair way that they would ever get to that. So honestly, a lot of this buying was done uh, that first season, those first few months on blind faith and blind trust. Uh, they had to open their hearts and open their minds to me, uh, have to be open to all the different ideas I was going to share. Uh, we were going to train very differently than we had in the past. We are going to approach every day very differently. Uh, we're going to do a lot of preparation for each opponent each week. Uh, and, and the credit students have that. If that first group last year didn't give us that opportunity, this would be an entirely different conversation. And mm. so uh, while we're having great success here in year two, a lot of it goes to people that were part of that program, whether they transferred out or out of the team now uh, or graduated. Uh, we would never have done this without them being able to find And then the second part of it is when we did have the turnover. We have uh, 17 new faces out of our 32, so literally more players on our team are new uh, than our returns this fall. And this group was hungry in the offseason. 
Uh, we were bummed we didn't make the NCAA tournament. We were in the first four teams out. Uh, that was a hard. You know, we brought everybody together, watched that selection show, and then see our team fall. That motivated the group to the spring of the online to be their best. And uh, like they're just hungry. Like this group is hungry. Uh, I, I, I'm so excited for tomorrow because we get an opportunity to play Nebraska, who we didn't get during the regular season. Uh, for all the success we've had, we're, we're still playing with a chip on our shoulder and more to prove. Uh, this gives us an opportunity to be in our Big Ten team. So uh, I, those are the biggest things, just that open-mindedness, that open heart. And I got to tell you, that's super hard for people to do these days with everything going on, especially for young people. to just blind trust something uh, to give everything. Coach, I have one more question. Probably the most important question you have been asked on this show, on BTN, anywhere you have been Ever. interviewed. So, okay, let's Owen, go. Owen, you have the picture? Right here we have the shoe room. Um, I believe I got this from uh, WLN6 News, so shout out to them. You have to tell us how your shoe room, uh, room came into, an ex into existence and then a few of your favorite kicks in there. Oh man, um, so the shoe room, I, I'm so grateful, a wife that's allowed me to just carry on this obsession year after year. <laughs> uh, if it hadn't been for, you know, I mean, the first years of our marriage, like what are we doing lugging all these shoes around from house to house? Like, <laughs> you never wear these shoes, like what are you doing? Like not understanding what's going on. I kept trying to tell her like they're worth value, like beyond like how they make me feel special, they are special. I can do something. We actually had a home improvement we had to so uh, I went and sold some shoes. I came back with several thousand dollars. And she's like, wait, how'd you get this? And I, told her, I sold five or six pairs of shoes. And she's like, hold on. You did? And that's how you got it? Like, I thought you didn't sell your full collection, just five or six pairs. Like, yeah. I think some of these go up in value. That explained the whole thing. So uh, for a while, it was like that. Uh, you know, there's just something about a new pair of sneakers that does it for me. My favorite pair of kicks, I mean, I'm a, see, I've been at Adidas school for 16 years, so mm. a lot of my collections are Adidas, a lot of Ultra Boots, Yeezys, uh, but I wasn't like the, uh, for now, I probably shouldn't talk about it. So, <laughs> uh, for me, you know, some of it's a throwback. I love, I mean, my everyday kicks are like Air Max 90s, go with anything, they're a throwback, but they're still, still modern, love Air Force Ones. Yeah. But my favorite, my favorites are Jordans, like, like, like most everybody's are, Jordan 1s, 3s, 4s guy. Some really rare, rare elevens uh, that I've worn over in the past. So uh, yeah, no, I'll, no, I'll throw them on. I'll have them on the sideline too. Like I've got some Jordan One Vortex. Their money has obviously is a soccer coach. Right. So those are perfect. But uh, yeah, man, sneakers. That's that's definitely where it's at. So, so do you do you are you on StockX buying them for over retail? Are you do you have bots on the sneakers app on the release date? Do you have a shoe plug? What what is, how do you get these? What's your uh, what's your method? You're going to uh, Dave Bruder. Is Bruder yeah, giving you? Bruder, Bruder, yeah. He won't he won't give he won't give you anything. <laughs> just so you know. Uh, yeah, and that's the discussion. You know, is what what kind of team shoe we're gonna get next year? Because obviously my team knows now. We had him over for dinner. Uh, we finally got everything situated. For this Who point. Bruder? No, no, oh, the team. <laughs> not oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. So they got to see the shoe room, and it was pretty wild to watch all them, watch all their faces. And I mean, I could literally pull out the shoes and tell you a story behind them, how I got them. I used to be that crazy guy, like fly to Vegas to pick up a pair of sneakers, <laughs> uh, just so I had them, or just because I knew they're going to be an exclusive release. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not doing the bots. Sometimes I go to StockX Co. Uh, a lot of times it's trades. I yeah. Got too many dang shoes, uh, so I shouldn't be spending more. That's awesome. That's that's probably that's the awesome. coolest story Love that we've gotten on this show. Love it. <laughs> Coach, can I get a – even though I was a former trustee, can I get a ring? No, you can't even score a goal. I want a ring. You, they put you in a penalty shoot up, Brian. You'd probably kick it backwards. I want a ring. I don't care. It sounds Stats. like we got to have some kind of skills competition set up. For that. Yeah. <laughs> you got to do like the Rubinho. You got to do like some sort of skill, skill move. We'll Ronaldinho. Your hands. We'll, throw you, we'll throw you in goal and if you can save a PK. Yeah. Nah, he's well, got to do one around the world. The, oh, oh, I got our uh, <laughs> coach. Congratulations. We wish you the best of luck tomorrow and going forward. And any idea on our seating in the NCAA tournament? Roughly, we're a I mean, one yeah. to four, kind of. 
yeah, I, mean, I think it's obviously going to depend on um, you know how this weekend plays out. Sure. Uh, I've seen this projected as high as a two, as low as a five, uh, somewhere in that range is, is a, a pretty wide range, but my best guess. Uh, you know, I think we have a good resume. We have five top 25 wins, RPIs anywhere between 11 and 13, depending on the day. Because uh, you got game matches, matches being played every day right now. Uh, then you know, we'll find out, obviously, in the selection show on, on, at 3.30 on Monday. But uh, we got to take care of business tomorrow, and that sets us up for another trophy, another opportunity to play a really high RPI team get away, whether that's being stated. One at a time. Well, Coach, we wish you the best of luck and uh, congratulations and good luck tomorrow. And uh, bring home a natty for us, will you? <laughs> sure, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate your time, Coach. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Coach. Yeah. Thanks, Brad. That's awesome having him. Yeah. Coach, oh, Jeff Hosler is yeah. just outstanding. Yeah. He's you know, one thing about that Big Ten championship, you can never take it away. Undefeated season. Undefeated. Un that amazing. Won't. That's it. Ingrained forever. Owen. Yep. What do we got? So we got some men's basketball. Let's start off with them. MSU beats Grand Valley on Owen's 360 MSU Sports Weekly Update. Malik Hell, he led the way with 15 points. A.J. Hogard had 14 points, 5 rebounds, and 5 assists. Mati Sissoko had 6 rebounds and 11 points. MSU starts their season against North Northern Arizona on Monday at 7 p.m. Now flipping over to women's basketball. MSU beat Saginaw Valley State in an exhibition match 90-56. Gabby Elliott, she had 14 points and 8 rebounds. The Spartans begin their season Monday at noon against Delaware State. So it's almost basketball season in East Lansing. Now flipping over to hockey. MSU lost to Notre Dame 5 0, but then tied them 1 to 1 on Saturday. Jagger Joshua, he's been fantastic all season long, had the lone goal on the weekend for MSU. And Dylan St. Cyr, he had 39 saves on Saturday, which was good enough for the Spartans to tie. Notre Dame. The Spartans take on Wisconsin this weekend, where I will be on the call. Now flipping over to men's soccer. MSU fell to Northwestern 2-1, to one, and they will take on Rutgers in the Big Ten Tournament on Friday. Now over to field hockey. MSU took down Kent State 3-1, to one, where Lulu Fulton, she had a goal, and Monique Jardel, she had six saves. Until Next week, I'm Owen Ozes with Owen's 360 MSU Sports Weekly Update. Thank you, Owen. We appreciate you. Yeah. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. I am Brian Mosalem, along with my co-host, Justin Thin. You are watching the SD4L show. Good night. God bless. And go green. And go Phillies. Please close your eyes, turn around, and count to nine. When you open them, I will be gone.